Hello, welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here in Lily's Leaf in Johannesburg, South Africa, but you also may notice that there's a truck behind me. That truck, this truck, was actually a front to smuggle in weapons during the anti-apartheid struggle into South Africa. And unbeknownst to me, after I worked at the University of the Western Cape, I was actually one of the tourists on this truck that happened to be smuggling weapons in, and I didn't know it until just yesterday. So this is 20, 25 years later, and now I'm discovering for the first time that this truck had been actually smuggling weapons into South Africa, which is appropriate to learn because this segment that we're going to be doing today is about history and the role of history in contemporary society. And we have two guests today. One is Nick Wolpe, who is the director of this place, Lily's Leaf, and the other guest is Sakiba Lequeti, who is a professor at WITS uh, here at the University of Witswatersrand in Johannesburg. So let's have a look. And in addition to the two guests I just mentioned, we have a special guest who had to do with Serafina, and we will hear from him in a moment. Sakiba, maybe if we could start with you. You're a, a history professor at WITS, and you've written a number of books. Can you speak to the issue of the role of importance of history in today's South Africa? Um, thank you, Steve. Um, history is really important uh, in terms of understanding our current situation. Um, in a sense, uh, we look at history in order to understand the present. Uh, without a deeper understanding of the past, we can really never really have a good grasp of how we came to be where we are. So ultimately, history is about grappling with the present. In as much as we look at the past, we really are trying to understand how South Africa, for instance, if you are looking at South African history, came to be the kind of society that you see here today. And Nick, do you agree with that? Very much so. I would like to just go one step further. If we look at the current socio-political dynamics which are being played out today in South Africa, had we maintained the importance of history and what our liberation struggle was about, had we ensured that the essence of our struggle, the essence of our history, became part of our DNA fabric, that we did not lose sight of fundamental documents, and most probably the most important of all of them is the Freedom Charter upon which our liberation struggle was predicated on, on the basis of our dynamic, far-sighted constitution we wouldn't be in this predicament. So the failure to grasp our past and to, pardon the pun, run with it, because the past, present, and future all merge together and become one, we would not be grappling with some of the issues we're faced with today. But do you think that if we were having this conversation in any other country, somebody wouldn't be saying, well, you know, our history isn't perfect, and perhaps we didn't learn the lessons from yesterday, and I wish we had? Well, I think other countries have not lost the importance of history. I mean, I just look at Britain at the moment. They're celebrating the 100th year of the end of the no, it's not the 100th year end, but the 100th year of the World War, First World War. Commemorations of battle after battle are being honored and remembered. We don't even do that. We don't honor and remember any of our Zulu battles. Major fundamental turning points in our history. We don't celebrate them. We don't acknowledge them. They don't exist. They've been forgotten. So I think the difference between South Africa and a lot of other countries is that they still hold on to their history. They still hold on to the memory of the past. Yes, they may be fading, but what we have managed to achieve in record time, if you start with 1990, in a short space of 27 years, we have managed to effectively obliterate our historical past, particularly with regard to our liberation struggle. And Sakiba, do you, do you agree with that? Uh, it, it, it's a form of actually uh, wanting to perpetuate some form of amnesia, not having to reckon with the past. And I agree with Nick about the history of the liberation struggle. 
not really being uh, very well known. And, 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 and currently, I think there is a big push. Uh, there's a big push uh, from the liberation movement itself, from the ruling party, the ANC, for you know, the history, and, and particularly the history of the uh, liberation movement, uh, to sort of get a prominent uh, place uh, in, in, the, uh, in the school curriculum. I'm here with Mgeni Ngema, who's a well-known musician around the world, but particularly well-known for his work with Serafina. Welcome. Hi. Good morning. Well, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I think, first of all, thank you for all the great work you did with Serafina and the Lion King. I think that they were, they were terrific. Thank you so much. Well, can you say a word or two about the impact of your work on the anti-apartheid struggle? Uh, it was... Uh, I remember in the early 80s, uh, we were in New York City uh, touring with one of my plays, Rosa Albert, and members at the time of the ANC, the African National Congress, came to me and said, you know, we've been uh, talking to the United Nations and talking to everybody about uh, the problems in South Africa, the apartheid uh, in South Africa, but no one is listening to us. Thank you for bringing this show because so many people now who have seen the show are beginning to want to have a conversation with us about apartheid. And I think that's true. I think that people really didn't understand uh, completely what was going on in South Africa. And I think Serafina helped to bring that story to life. Serafina most, uh, most definitely because it just brought in thousands and thousands of people throughout the time that it was on Broadway in Manhattan all of, all of those years and every night we were receiving letters backstage written by the members of the audience and some of the people who were coming from uh, huge multinational companies saying we now really understand what is going on in South Africa. Well speaking of the multinational companies uh, as you well know I mean one of the more controversial things that happened in that era was the issue about whether or not artists should perform in South Africa. And one of the great albums that was ever uh, produced about South Africa was the Graceland album. And my understanding is that you had something to do with making sure that that actually happened. Yes, well, when, uh, during the anti-apartheid struggle and the boycott uh, that was going on, uh, there was talk that Graceland should be boycotted. And uh, at the time, I went to Paul Simon at his office on 58th Street, and I said to him, we want to make sure that uh, Graceland continues. For one of the reason was that Ladysmith Black Mambazo, who did that song with Paul Simon, Homeless, uh, are such a loved group in South Africa, but they were not known at all around the world. And they came from abject poverty. And I felt that if they were not allowed to tour with Graceland, they would return back to poverty. And Graceland was an important stepping stone for Ladysmith Black Bambazo and for Ray Peary and Stimela, among other artists. And we went to talk to the ANC office in New York at that time, uh, persu persuading them not to boycott Graceland, and we succeeded. Well, in terms of telling your story, uh, this is about history, but my understanding of you is even now, not only have you told stories before about South Africa, but you're working on even a new movie now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I've just finished uh, filming my new movie, Asina Mali, uh, which is a, a prison movie. Uh, a, a guy, an ex-South African, who was an MK soldier himself, who now works for Amnesty International in the United States, uh, gets posted to South Africa in the, mid, in the middle 80s. Uh, he goes to the prison in South Africa and works with the inmates uh, to try and rehabilitate them through the medium of theater, song, and dance. And does it work? Not to give away the whole movie. <laughs> uh, we, we've done a few screenings. We did a screening in Cannes and uh, in France. We did a screening in Durban recently, the Durban International Film Festival, and everyone loves the movie. And we hope to be uh, taking it to the US quite soon. Well, we look forward to that. Um, if I can ask you a question about The Lion King. Uh, the Lion King resonated very much with uh, people in the United States. Do you see that as a South African story? Definitely. You know, uh, 
even though there isn't a line in the script that says this is based in South Africa, it's rather based on an African story. But the production is more South African than any other country in Africa. I mean, the music is mostly Zulu. The cast, even from the original cast members, uh, they mostly came from uh, South Africa, from uh, Zululand, from KZN. In fact, I worked on the, on the original soundtrack myself with Lebu and Hans Zimmer. And most of those singers, they were singers from my company, committed artists, all of whom came from Durban. So it's really mostly a South African production. Well, fair enough. In terms of history, one of the th criticisms that uh, we get sometimes when we do things about history is that, well, this is really interesting to talk about the history, but why aren't we focusing on today? How, how would you answer that criticism? Why aren't we focusing on today? Yeah, so why are we spending so much time on history? Like right now, we're at Lily's Leaf, which is a historic site in South Africa and a very important historic site. But why are we spending all this time on history? And why are we talking about the past? Why aren't we talking about the future? Well, uh, there is an old saying that in order to know about your future, you have to know about your past, your history. And we have so many lessons that can be learned from history. And throughout uh, time, we have learned that if we go back to our history and find out what went right and what went wrong, we tend to have answers for the future. And what are some of those answers for the future? If we, look at, if we think about the anti-apartheid struggle and, and where we are, we're in a historic site, we're in a historic room in a historic site. What are some lessons from the anti-apartheid era, well, the apartheid era and the anti-apartheid struggle that you think bring us to today? Well, I think that uh, during uh, 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 the apartheid struggle or the anti-apartheid struggle, all nations of the world got together and, uh, uh, and tackled one subject matter, which was that uh, it was inhuman to oppress uh, another uh, uh, group of people because of the color of their skin. And I think that that's a lesson great lesson to be learned that it should never be repeated again anywhere else in the world. Uh, that's a lesson we can learn from anti-apartheid, that the whole world, all nations of the world, united to fight apartheid, and we won. And you did, and how can, can you, we delve a little deeper into the role of you and other artists in South Africa. How did you actually collaborate with each other? We had a mission, we had, uh, we knew that victory was certain, but the only, the only way that we could win together was to collaborate, was to work together. Like myself and Huma Sigala, when we collaborated in the writing of the music for Sarafina, we had one thing in common, that freedom is coming tomorrow. Well, in fact, wasn't there a song? Wasn't, the lead, wasn't that the lead song? Yes, that's one of the major uh, songs in Sarafina. Freedom is coming tomorrow, which I wrote when the country was burning, actually. And a lot of people ask me, Bongeni, how can you write a song that says freedom is coming tomorrow when the country is in flames? And my answer was, I believe that if we ha fight harder, freedom is certain. Well, it's interesting you say that because I think I saw an interview somewhere where Hugh Masekela was asked the same question and said that he sang a certain song in different ways because there was a point at which he wasn't a hundred percent sure that victory was going to come. A lot of artists, I remember uh, even Barney Simon, who was a comrade, uh, artistic director of the Market Theatre at the time, may his soul rest in peace. Uh, during the first run through of Serafina at the Market Theatre, uh, at interval, he called me to his office after that very song, Freedom is Coming Tomorrow, and he looked at me in the eye and he said, Bongeni, do you really believe freedom is coming tomorrow? And I said, why? He said, because if you don't believe in it, I think you should take that song out of the show. Because a lot of people in the mid 80s did not actually believe that freedom would come. And somehow there was something that kept on driving me. Something said to me, freedom has to come. And indeed, five years later, Mandela came out of prison. That's interesting. So you did believe it? I did believe it. And where do you think that belief came from? I don't know where it came from, somewhere at the center of my spirit. 
can we get to the center of your spirit? Because your music is really, really powerful. And I've always thought it was. Maybe it's hard, you're welcome. Maybe it's hard to put it into words, but can you, but where does that music come from? Maybe I, sh I can only answer that question by telling a short story. Uh, the idea of Sarafina came when I was sitting with Winnie Mandela in Orlando, when Mandela was uh, in jail, and I used to visit her a lot uh, with a lot of other comrades as well. And she was cooking in her kitchen. I remember we had come from a funeral of another comrade who had been killed. And I asked her, I said, Mama, what do you think is finally going to happen in this country? She stopped what she was doing, and she looked at me and said, Mbongeni, I wish I had <clears throat> a big blanket to cover the faces of the little ones so that they do not see the bitter end. Those were her exact words. And as I drove out of her house that afternoon, I remember <clears throat> I began to see images of young kids, school children, running in school, wearing school uniforms, and they were singing that freedom is coming. And as soon as I got home, I went to the piano. I started writing the song. Welcome back. I guess what I wanted to get to, if we possibly could, is the role of the arts in the commemoration. So do either of you have something that you might be able to say about the role of history in the arts together in terms of commemorations? One of the aspects we suffer from with, if we, listen, if we look at the title of our national department, it's called the Department of Arts and Culture. And there, is a, there lies the rub of the problem, that we have separated arts, culture, history, or whether you want to call it heritage. They should all be one, because culture forms a part of memory. Art is a part of heritage and culture and history because of the fact of passing down traditions through art. You look at the Khoisan people, for example, the unique artwork on the walls, which are lo we're losing. So I think the, the point being I'm trying to make here is that we shouldn't be separating these and defining them as if they're separate and individual, because it comes back to one of the root problems that we have in this country. No sense of identity, no sense of cohesion, no sense of belonging. We are a country without an identity. Yes, we always talk about when the Springboks play, when the Proteas play, when um, Bafana Bafana play, and suddenly there is this uprise of patriotism and a sense of belonging, but it's temporal. We do not have a sense of belonging and a sense of who we are as South Africans because we have failed to address some of the key underlying issues which form the root of that sense of belonging, which is tied up with history. And history, in some respects, should be the overarching umbrella. Because in history, you have culture, which is predicated on tradition, which also comes into conflict with modernity. You have art, which is predicated on a long, rich history of a particular culture which is passed down from generation to generation. I mean, for example, the book Africa Meets Africa in the Belly Women Designing Identity. Well, you can hold that up if you'd like to show some viewers. I mean, this is not mine. I think you should <laughs> speak about it. But this identifies it. This, this is a combination of art, culture, and heritage, and all rolled into one. That's fundamental to what we should be accomplishing. We shouldn't be talking about art, culture, and history. What, just like I said originally, we past, present, future all roll into one. They have all form part of one identity and one process and one purpose. And that is, again, if I just to repeat myself, is part of the problem that we're suffering with and struggling to come to terms with. Because where I disagree is history in its entirety and totality has been marginalized because of the importance of the STEM subjects, 
science, technology, engineering, mathematics, which starts with government. It says, we need you to teach these subjects. The university tells the schools, the schools tell the pupils, you are not going to get employment unless you study these subjects. We also have a bit of a throwback to Reaganomics and Thatcherism, where the humanities are seen as a breeding ground of radicalism. That the, you know, anthropology, history, sociology was this kind of breeding ground for radicalism. And we still have a, a legacy of that which seems to be permeating. So you've got two very fundamental, what I would call, issues pushing back on why history and the humanities are still struggling in the 21st century. This perception I've, of radicalism and the battle against the fact that the important subjects are the STEM subjects. Well, that's an interesting point. And Sakiba, you teach every day at, at yes. a university, at a major university. Mm. Do you struggle when you meet with students privately and they say to you, my mom or my dad or somebody else is pressuring me not to study what you're teaching me? Right. One of the perpetual questions that we are asked, not just by the, by the, by the students, by the high school students, are grade 12s and grade 11s, but we are often asked the question by the parents of these children, what the hell is my child going to do with history? Because there is this perception that, um, and especially in relation, I, I fully agree with what, you, with what you are saying, Nick, about how our government has actually put, or rather continues to put a lot of emphasis on science, maths, and technology at the expense of humanities. And I fully agree with uh, the argument that that is in part to do with the fact that you know the humanities in general are the breeding are perceived to be the breeding ground of um, you know radicalism, and and yet we have actually seen that in instances in places where students are actually allowed to do maths and science and history as well, it's a mighty combination. They actually do well. So you know. It, you know, it's, it's, it's probably because of ideological reasons why history is actually marginalized. But let me also respond to a couple of uh, questions that you raised earlier on. The question about, you know, the arts uh, and, and, and their role. I mean, if you look at commemoration, a lot of commemorations actually involve the arts. Um, on commemoration days, there's a lot of music. You know, artists are actually in, invited to you know, to be part of the commemoration and to provide entertainment. I'm, I'm not quite sure that the kind of entertainment that is often being provided on, the, on those days is kind of educa educational. Like on uh, June 16th, on Youth Day, I'm not certain that there's enough emphasis on the history so that people go to those commemorations, but the essence of those commemorations is actually lost because you do not have the emphasis on the history, the importance of the history, what that day symbolizes as a day, of, as a day on which the youth are commemorated uh, or are remembered for, the, for their valor, for their bravery of taking up the mighty apartheid state. So, but then the arts is there. Uh, I think we can debate what the role, uh, what the role, what kind of role they actually play on that particular day. We only have a minute or two left, though. Uh, so, but if you don't mind, one, since we have a minute or two left, why don't you, can you tell us a little bit about your books? Okay. Um, essentially, this is a book that is pitched at the level of uh, uh, metric, which is grade 12, and, and transition into university. So it's, it's really uh, taking an approach that actually says that, um, you know, we really need to historicize um, Ndebele architecture, rather than look at it as a fossil, kind of assume that this is something that, um, you know, the Ndebele have always done since time immemorial. So uh, what is of essence here, and this is where I come in as a historian, is to actually look at how Ndebele um, art, uh, which we see in this colorful uh, geometric pattern murals, 
um, has actually changed over time and how it actually started. And then, so, um, and, and we look at various other, com uh, you know, components, the motifs that it, com uh, it has actually incorporated over time. The movement from the sort of the natural colors through the acrylic paints and so forth. So essentially, it's, uh, this is aimed at actually showing that um, you can actually use mathematics to understand Ndebele art among other factors. Well, well we're gonna, I think we're going to need to leave it at that. Um, that was a really interesting way that the arts intersects with history. And if you have specific comments that you would like to send to our viewer mailbox, please do so at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.